getting designation as a baby-friendly hospital. And this is an initiative from the World Health Organization and UNICEF from 1991 that was aimed at promoting and protecting breastfeeding worldwide. Every country has its own authority for uh, giving a breastfeeding designation, and over 19,000 countries worldwide are designated. There's a, a huge push in the United States for hospitals to come into compliance, not compliance, alignment with baby-friendly uh, hospital initiative. Um, there's Department of Health and Human Services on the federal level and Departments of Health on the state level are providing support and encouragement for local facilities to become baby friendly. There are 10 steps to become baby friendly and we're here tonight uh, for two of them in particular. We have a written breastfeeding policy that's routinely communicated to all healthcare staff and our policy uh, has been under construction for a number of months and was approved the perinatal practice committee this morning. The breastfeeding, the baby friendly hospital committee um, adapted an academy of breastfeeding medicine protocol. So our breastfeeding policy reflects best practices from the academy of breastfeeding medicine. And then tonight we're here to train all healthcare staff and skills necessary to implement this policy. I want to thank you very much for being here because um, people at this hospital have been trying for 15 <coughs> years to get the baby friendly designation and the hardest piece was to train the healthcare providers and to make sure so that we're all on the same page. Um, we need to be informing all pregnant women about the benefits and management of breastfeeding, help mothers initiate breastfeeding within a half an hour of birth, show mothers how to breastfeed and maintain lactation even if they're separated from their babies. Um, encourage exclusive breastfeeding unless medically indicated, practice rooming in and keeping mothers and babies together 24 hours a day, <laughs> encourage breastfeeding on demand, avoiding artificial nipples because it can confuse babies who are learning to coordinate sucking and swallowing, and artificial nipples, the mechanism of tongue movement and jaw movement is actually the opposite of breastfeeding. Some babies are facile, going between breast and bottle, some babies are not until they've got breastfeeding down. So the Academy of Breastfeeding uh, Medicine and American Academy of Pediatrics encourages mothers to not use pacifiers in the first month. Um, after that, the mothers and babies will probably have a pretty good handle on it and they can handle going back and forth. And then to foster the establishment of breastfeeding support groups so that there's follow-up afterwards. Obviously, we're all aiming for beautifully healthy babies. And if you were wondering how I know that this is a breastfed baby, that drop of milk right now there is thin and bluish, which is the color of natural breast milk, especially the four milk, the milk that comes first. So our breastfeeding policy, like I said, is adapted from the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Um, and we will now have a breastfeeding standing committee that will meet at least annually to make sure our policy is in alignment with best practices. Um, we're working on tools to educate mothers better and in your packets is a draft of advantages of breastfeeding and we're floating that as a possible handout for our prenatal patients. So please look that over and if you have comments about the advantages of breastfeeding um, please get back with us and we'll refine that and we'll make sure the language and the information is accessible. Um, encourage exclusive breastfeeding. I, I hope that at the end of this time that we as a group could be giving a consistent message to mothers to encourage exclusive breastfeeding for three months. And the reason I would encourage exclusive breastfeeding for three months is that almost all mothers and babies have got it down by two months, and by three months, it's a joy and a pleasure, and they'll be happy to exclusively breastfeed this for six months. Um, but I think for mothers in our community who are a little skeptical or inexperienced around breastfeeding, um, a three, asking them to consider exclusive breastfeeding for three months is a realistic goal. Uh, and one that if they get that far, or when they get that far, uh, they'll be in the pleasure phase of breastfeeding. Um, 
our policy will include documenting feedings and making sure women have lactation support in the hospital and after discharge. Um, most of you know I've been here at um, Cheshire Medical Center, Dr. Hitchcock, um, for two years now. And uh, Rudy and I, in the course of trying to find some workable way of having a two obstetrician family, um, lived a lot of places before we ended up here, trying to find something workable. Um, and I, I have to say that this place has its act together better than any other place we've ever worked. Um, and the fact that we are a group that works together makes it possible for us to take our practice to the next level that other hospitals that are dealing with stupid private practice turf wars and you know lack of cooperation between physicians and hospitals, we don't really, in the scheme of things, we don't have much of that to deal with. And as a result, we're able to have some really top-notch care here. And part of that is our lactation support. So we have four board-certified um, lactation consultants. Uh, the letters after their name are IBCLC. Um, at one time, I wanted to become an IBCLC, but the demands to become an IBCLC are too high. The amount of time, training, experience, and working with breastfeeding mothers, I couldn't meet the requirements. Um, so they are a tremendous resource. They do have continuing education and have to recertify. Elaine just retook took the recertification exam and had to basically get board certified all over again. Um, we're going to encourage skin-to-skin -skin contact with continuous contact until the first breastfeed. Um, and we're, I'm going to be highlighting this quite a bit later on, um, in part because skin-to-skin -skin contact is going to mitigate some of the negative influences we've introduced in our obstetrical care and our neonatal care. So in an ideal world, our bodies would be giving birth naturally, and baby would go immediately onto the mother's body and stay with her continuously through the early months of the baby's life. And that isn't always what happens. But if we can put some emphasis and attention on that skin-to-skin -skin contact, the baby's and mother's instincts, hormonal, behavioral instincts, can be awakened, and the baby and the mother will be able to do their very best in initiating the breastfeeding relationship. We have guidelines for supplements, pacifiers, rooming in, nipple creams, and nipple shields. There are going to be a few changes from our current practice. Um, supplements will either be on a provider's order or at a mother's request with um, her being counseled that there are some negative impacts on breastfeeding of offering supplements in the early days. Uh, discourage use of pacifiers except for circumcision or other painful procedures. Rooming in, mothers will not be having the nurses offer to take the babies at night. Uh, they will have to initiate a request if they want their baby taken from the room. Um, and the, um, there's some interesting sleep research that says that mothers get just as much sleep when their babies are near them. Um, nipple shields and nipple creams don't solve breastfeeding problems in most cases. Um, they can soothe a current problem, but they don't fix the problem. So we'd like lactation to be supervising when those are appropriately used. Uh, policy for addressing ineffective feedings, pumping, mother-baby separation, making sure our mothers are plugged into community resources for ongoing support. And we already observe the WHO guidelines on the marketing of breast milk substitutes. There's a tremendous amount of research that advertising, diaper bags, uh, patient education materials, coupons, and so on, undermine uh, establishment of exclusive breastfeeding and duration. And then educating healthcare providers in, in an ongoing way. Um, for full disclosure, I don't have any, um, I don't, have, uh, I don't get any speaker's fees from any uh, companies, and I don't have, you know, peddling any products, but for full disclosure, um, I am born into a breastfeeding family. Both my, uh, both parents' sides of the family were breastfeeding family. All three kids in my family were, were breastfeeding. My, my brother is nine years older, so I have 
real memories of my, my brother breastfeeding, and that was just normal. Um, I am mother to three breastfed children. Um, so the lifetime duration of breastfeeding has something to do with how much mothers are benefited by breastfeeding, and uh, let's just put it, I've reduced my breast cancer risk quite a bit. And if you want to do the math later, you can figure out how many years total I nursed my kids. But I reduced my breast cancer risk by about 48%. I am a retired La Leche League leader. Um, to become a leader, I uh, had to read a gazillion books, was trained in facilitating mother-baby process and facilitating mother-to-mother -mother support, and I put hundreds and hundreds of hours into that. Um, I have been a speaker on breastfeeding topics before and I'm board certified OBGYN, and I got two hours of training, one hour in medical school in the mammary gland, and one hour in residency uh, from a breastfeeding female faculty member. Um, that's it, so you know that, that doesn't, it's not where my expertise comes from. So we're gonna start in terms of advantages of breastfeeding. I'm gonna focus mostly on one paper that talks about how affordable healthcare begins with breastfeeding. And I used to have a bumper sticker like this on my car. Uh, I got it in 1997. It came from the New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force. Uh, when I lived in New Mexico, and in fact, when I got that bumper sticker, I took a few extra because I knew that once my car, I got rid of that car, I'd want to put a new one on a new car. So I had one on my 2004 Subaru until I had to get the bumper replaced. There was damage to the bumper and, you know, I had to have the bumper replaced. So I went online looking for these bumper stickers because I wanted to give you some. I want you to have a bumper sticker put on your car. And I looked and looked and looked, and I could not find this bumper sticker anywhere. I did, was able to get some made um, custom. But, looking on the internet, I found a picture of this bumper sticker I was looking for. <laughs> can you imagine? I mean, you can find anything on the internet but your own car! <laughs> so, uh, there was um, a photographer in Ithaca, New York, and she took a whole bunch of pic cool pictures, because everybody in Ithaca has at least six bumper stickers making statements about something. And uh, it turns out there were two bumper stickers on my car that were in our photo collection. The other one uh, says, um, Midwives Deliver. Okay, so um, I'm going to highlight, okay, so I'm going to go to the nerd, stodgy, you know, PowerPoint presentation part of the talk here. And I'm going to focus primarily on this uh, article from Pediatrics last year, The Burden of Suboptimal Breastfeeding in the United States. Um, this pediatric Tosman analysis built on methods of other, um, other um, authors. They um, utilized uh, data from the Federal Agency for Healthcare Health Research Quality um, to talk about it. And in the United States, it's estimated that there are 900 extra deaths annually and $13 billion worth of cost, direct and indirect costs associated with us not having an optimal early breastfeeding. What's the definition of optimal? Six months of exclusive breastfeeding before the introduction of solids and before the introduction of complementary and supplementary foods. Um, and they said, okay, 100% is not realistic. We'll just go. We'll just go for 90 percent or 80 percent. How much impact would that have? So I just want to put it in some perspective, because the CDC estimates that in 2006 there were somewhere around 36 to 48 deaths from early onset GBS. And the reason I'm giving you a range on this is that they don't collect data from all the states. They have a number of states that they actually collect data from, and then they extrapolate to the rest of the country. Um, and I think New Hampshire actually is one of the states that is part of their monitoring. But anyway, so it's estimated that 36 to 48 deaths in 2006 were due to GBS. And we give GBS an awful lot of attention. And compared to 900 deaths, um, you know, maybe we need to be giving this more attention. So where do those deaths come from? This is from the um, Agency for uh, Healthcare Research Quality, research, healthcare, quality, whatever, um, that approx and this is looking at 90% compliance with exclusive breastfeeding for six months or 80% compliance. Um, and those deaths are from SIDS, necrotizing enterocolitis, 
lower respiratory tract infections, childhood asthma, and childhood leukemia, and type 1 diabetes. So 450 of those 900 deaths are SIDS deaths. And I'd just like you to start to be aware as you're seeing sick kids, admitting sick kids to the hospital, hearing about illnesses in families, to notice how much of that is, of these diseases and conditions are occurring among breastfeeding families and how many of them are in formula feeding families. So, okay, this is I think about the last slide that's gonna have too much data on it. Um, this is the excess costs, and um, I am just reporting the news. In terms of the premature deaths, apparently when you are calculating the value of a life, it's something around $10 million. So, you know, a big chunk of this $13, million, or $13 billion is related to these premature deaths. But you can see the numbers for otitis media, nearly a billion dollars of excess cost. Uh, atopic dermatitis, childhood obesity, lower respiratory tract infection, and hospitalizations, that's a pretty big one, $500 million uh, almost for uh, pneumonias and bronchiolitis and so on and so forth. Childhood asthma, necrotizing enterocolitis, gastroenteritis, type one diabetes, and childhood leukemia. I want to go back to this because when I lived in New Mexico, there was, um, I lived in a very small town and I was, uh, lived in Taos where there's um, an Anglo population, an Native American population, a Hispanic population, and there are about 2,500 to 3,000 people registered as part of Taos Pueblo. And um, I took care of a woman and her cousin who both had babies in the same year. And uh, one of the women breastfed and the other did not. And the one who did not, um, her baby died of RSV and was a formula feeding baby. And, you know, when that baby died, um, would that baby have been sick with RSV? Sure. Would it have been hospitalized? Probably. Would it have died? Probably not. Um, and, so as gently as we could, using family support from her cousin, encouraged her to breastfeed her subsequent baby, which she was able to do. Um, yes? These numbers, are they controlled for cigarette smoking? Do you happen to know? You know, um, the, what they did um, of the Federal Agency for Healthcare and Research Quality looked at all the studies that do um, control for co-founders, co confounders rather, um, and then they said we think that the magnitude of the impact of breastfeeding, looking at all the studies and the meta-analyses and so on and so forth, is this much, and then they published that, and then the researchers for this paper <coughs> called all that information and used it for calculations. So impact on women's health, um, a lot of it is a dose-dependent relationship, and that's a way, another way of saying however many months or years you breastfeed uh, will determine how much of a protective effect there is for breastfeeding for moms. And there is um, some controversy about some of these things, but there is definitely association with all of them and some of them uh, are stronger than just an association. Obesity, osteoporosis, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, di diabetes, cardiovascular disease, ovarian cancer, and endometrial cancer, breast cancer. The three uh, female cancers are probably largely related to suppression of fertility and being a, having a period of hypoestrogenic inovulation, um, also known as the lactational amenorrhea method when you can dispense with birth control while bre breastfeeding. The World Health Organization and the Catholic Church got together on this because around the world and among Catholics, they really, really, really wanted to know how protective breastfeeding was against close child spacing. And uh, so if you're interested in how to advise women who want to know 
how much they can rely on breastfeeding, let me know. If you want to hear an hour on that, I can tell you about that. <laughs> um, longer the lifetime duration of breastfeeding, lower the risk. And impact on the mother incompetence. Um, there's actually a growing body of research that shows that breastfeeding improves mother incompetence. Improved nurturing behaviors, enhanced sensitivity to infant cues when looked at a year later, more infant holding, less infant crying, improved mood and infant regard. This study is interesting because they took, um, they took women who were mixed feeding, partial formula and bottle, partial breastfeeding. And they did a crossover study where they started some women with a, a bottle feed and some women with breastfeed, and then later on, they did the opposite. And they asked questions about how they felt about their babies, basically. And women had a higher regard for their babies after a, a breastfeed. And there's good reason for that, and we'll come back to that in a little while. There was a WIC study that uh, randomized women to breastfeeding or bottle feeding. Obviously, they couldn't enforce what choices women made. But they provided both groups with a mothering support group afterwards that went on for a year. And what they found among the breastfeeding WIC mothers is that they had so much pride that they had provided for their babies that they showed uh, higher rates of returning to school and of getting a degree, higher rates of employment, uh, greater sense of empowerment over their destiny. Um, and in, when uh, the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative came into play, a number of different countries, notably Thailand, Costa Rica, Russia, and the Philippines, looked at what happened with uh, child abandonment rates when they instituted Baby Friendly. And uh, one study in Russia in particular it fell by half. So the number of babies that were abandoned each year fell by half. So the best things about breastfeeding. I'm going to tell you, go ahead and bring the other gals in. So I'm going to tell you just one that I think is really cool because I, I noticed this as a mother and yet I didn't know why. And so now that I know why, I think it's really cool. Lactoferrin is a substance in breast milk that binds to iron. And iron bioavailability in breast milk is excellent. One of the things that's very hard when you're comparing formula and breast milk is even if the amount of iron in the two liquids are the same, it's not the same. Because the bioavailability in breast milk, 43 to 49% of the iron is absorbed while in formula, it's just 4%. Okay, so lactoferrin and poopy diapers. I did not know why, when I was a new mother, why my baby's diapers didn't really stink. I did, you know, I noticed because I thought it was gonna be poop, you know, like really poop. Um, and it wasn't. And it turns out that lactoferrin, by binding the iron, prevents the growth of the typical enterics like E. coli and so forth, and other pathogenic bacteria. And what is the prominent flora in an exclusively breastfed baby is lactobacillus bifidum and other species, which is why being born vaginally is important. The baby is picking up the lactobacillus on the way out and colonizing your gut, and then Breastfeeding maintains the predominance of the lactobacillus, and that's why exclusively breastfed baby's poop doesn't stink. Um, there is a somewhat higher rate of asthma and atopic disease uh, among C-section babies, and in some places there is an intentional effort to swab the vagina and colonize the baby at birth. So they're colonized by their mother's normal germs rather than our hospital germs. So we have three women and two, ba two of three babies here with us today. These gals are from the Moms Club, and I'm just going to provide a little bit of background and then have these guys uh, talk with you. So Emily Nichols and Elaine Prescott Austin are two of the IBCLC lactation consultants here. Can you catch? 
that she turn to the baby instead of turning away ah. first and then come back. Mm -hmm. She could just immediately turn and respond to the baby's name. How about you, Haley? Um, well, think what they said. Um, for me, it was also the nurturing and the bonding. Um, Sumner was my second child. I had a 14-year-old. Sumner was born, so I don't know how old breastfeeding thing. Um, but for me, 14 years prior, I don't think that um, that I understood it to be all that I did this time. When he, when I did it with Levi, my, my older boy, it was something mom did, and I'm just going to do that, and we'll wing it. You know, I really wasn't educated about it at all. Um, and I did it for, you know, as long as mom said, when he bites, then you're done. And what I've soon learned is, you know, this time around is, you know, biting is just a phase, and you can keep going after that. And there are benefits to keep going after that. And I didn't know any of that the first time. I was sort of educated by my mom and my friends, and, you know, at the time, my friends were, you just told me But he was 10 months old, and that seemed to be like a long time for them. Um, I'd gone back to work, and the pumping seemed like a hassle, and it just, you know, in my mind, it was all of those things outweighed um, what really was best for my child. And so this time around, um, having the education, having the support was very much different. And it's just been wonderful, and it's allowed me to really bond with my baby and to know that I'm giving him the very best. Kelly's had a whole bunch of challenges, which I'm not going to outline. She wants to talk about them. But I would like to just say that Haley has nursed her son with one breast. And there are different circumstances why that can come about. Um, but a lot of mothers worry so much about supply. And I'd just like to put a little perspective on it. Um, yes, some women have a larger storage capacity in their breasts and will have a rapid flow of milk, and other women will have a smaller storage capacity, and so when they nurse or pump, more frequent pumpings or more frequent nursings in a 24-hour period will get the same volume delivered, but they don't have, like, you know, they're not going to put out the ounces. So it, women are fully capable of nursing twins. I know personally of three sets of triplets exclusively breastfed. And in the 1700s, there was a law in France that you couldn't be a wet nurse for more than six babies. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not, probably not all capable of nurturing six babies or three or whatever, but uh, we're going to be able to find a way to make it work, even if we're only nursing on one breast. Are there other things you guys would like to say about advantages or? surprises of what it's meant to you? I do have to say I agree with the bonding. It's kind of, you know, I carried him for nine months and now I can provide for him and I'm the only one that can for however long I choose to nurse. Um, I'm the only one that's going to be able to do that. Also the immunity piece, seeing your baby recover from illnesses so much quicker. Um, it's also so rewarding and, and, and reassuring. And then the whole middle of the night feeding like it's there. I can't imagine it's such an exhausting time when you're early in the in, in motherhood, but to be getting up and down and up and down stairs um, to go heat bottles is, I can't imagine. Just to be able to <laughs> pick up your shirt and feed them and know that you're giving them the best thing you can. It's been just really rewarding. I've always tried to figure out how to convey that bonding piece of, you know, like, you know, talk about bonding, what does that mean? And, and the, the best way that I can say it is, when was the last time you heard somebody say, oh, you know, when I was formula feeding my baby, <laughs> I just ha felt this outpouring of love, looking down at the baby as I was formula feeding. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the bottles were always warm, and right? people don't talk like that. <laughs> And I, and I think it is in part hormonal, when the oxytocin and prolactin are flowing, that I sometimes almost went to the point of weeping or tears because I felt this, this rush of emotion toward my baby that I didn't feel at any other time, only while nursing the baby. Um, and I don't know how to study that. I don't know how to capture that, other than some of those infant regard things I was telling you about before. Um, so that's part of it. So Elaine and Emily, you guys asked the Moms Club this week. 
what do they have to say about benefits and advantages? Um, I guess I'll start by just sharing a little bit about Mom's Club. Um, we meet, you know, every Tuesday from 10 to 11.30. There is no late. Um, and we have a pretty big size group of 14 to 16 moms that come with babies. Um, we provide three white blankets from upstairs and toys from our, our children. <laughs> and, um, and lots of uh, support and encouraging words and answering questions and things like that. So. We actually, I just wanted to let you know, we provide very little, but we have a good group, and, and it's been going on for 24 years. Elaine has done mom's stuff for 24 years here. It actually kind of takes the place of the culture that's been missing, and the, we don't have the generation after generation of women uh, breastfeeding the babies to teach each other, and people just come, and we just talk about what you do, so it takes place of that that surrounding women with women because women are off working. They um, are very isolated if they're not sometimes. Some of our moms, um, you come quite a ways. So you drive about a half hour to come because Antrim's not a place that's totally thriving with mothers to come to your house. You know, we don't have the same neighborhoods that we used to have, things like that. So it kind of fits that need. Um, this past week, we asked the same questions. We had 14 mothers and babies. It was a bad mom. They put us in the smaller room this time or something more important. We did have one biting incident, but that doesn't happen all the time. But in all of that, um, we asked them to just to answer the same questions, and it's almost universal. Um, some of the things they said were, um, it allowed me more sleep. It was a cure-all. We had that conversation a few nights ago with different women. It's a cure-all for the bump and the falling down and the I'm tired, I'm lonely, I'm bored. Yeah, all of them sick. It's, Vaccination, there you go. It works um, for all of those things. Um, um, I was the first successful mother to breastfeed in my family, which is what this generation is reporting because they come from generations of not um, having breastfed, one or two of them anyway. Um, helped me connect after a cesarean. Um, and another mom said it was the first thing that was right for her and her plan. Another mom was able to breastfeed during her cesarean while they were closing afterwards, and she went and told the whole group that that was a highlight in her motherhood. So somebody here was probably in on that cesarean and having an anesthesia or wherever it was, having that all come possible if the mother is well enough and interested is a very important thing or was to her. Um, nice to know I'm the only one who can make milk for him. I am sustaining life. I mean, it's pretty profound. Um, let's see. And I think that was pretty much sums up um, what they had to say as a group. So the second question I asked <coughs> folks was, what do you wish providers knew about supporting recipe? What are they looking for from us? I've been beyond it now twice and looking back on it that first couple weeks is such a fragile time and you know you're in such an emotionally strange place that you've never been before if you're a first time mom and I think um, and all you really want is a good night's sleep and and you know the idea of being able to pass off the baby for someone else to do that feels kind of exciting so I think a woman who's teetering um, really needs that reassurance so they see pediatricians on day two, and I think if pediatricians can be reinforcing to moms to just say, what a gift you're giving your child, and um, you know, really kind of that, keep going, that a girl <laughs> um, kind of message. Um, because I think you know, moms aren't seen until like it's probably week six, so there's quite a long time, and, and a lot of people that I know, they fall off very quickly. Um, so I think you know, pediatricians are somewhat uniquely positioned and then I also think um, probably painting a realistic view, you know, knowing that that for those first couple weeks, like yes, you're going to have a baby on your breast for the large majority of the day, and um, you know, and I think especially if you've worked up until the bitter end, and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, here I am on the sofa, like doing nothing productive in terms of how we, I guess, you know, culturally think we're productive. So I think you know, having that kind of. Everybody supporting everyone, really encouraging mom that she's doing the right thing. 
um, is huge. One thing you can say to moms is, you know, we go to our jobs or we're homemakers and we're doing productive work. And when we're pregnant and breastfeeding, we're doing reproductive work. This is the work that sustains our culture, our community, and we are nurturing our babies in the best possible way. So acknowledging that reproductive work that women are doing and, and how valuable that is over the long haul. I think um, the biggest, as I mentioned before, it was very hard for me in the beginning, and I think it was mostly because my expectations were so wet. Um, I, you know, you read pregnancy books, and the first like few chapters are on breastfeeding. You know, when you know how to breastfeed, and I'd be like, "What's the problem?" You know, you just you just do it, and you're fine. But all of a sudden, I had this baby, and I was stuck on the couch for eight hours, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I must be doing something wrong." And um, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so. I think that was a really difficult part um, for me, and I think going to mom's group really did provide that support. So I came in five weeks after having him, and I was like, I don't know what's going on. He's nursing like an, for an hour, and then I'm off for an hour, and then an hour later he wants to nurse again, and I'm like, you know, he's sleeping half the time. He's nursing, you know, I don't understand, and and really the the support that those that the Elaine and Emily have provided have been amazing. I can say the price was really for me. And um, so that the, the support and just having realistic expectations. Can I ask a question that before you um, hatched, did you have any counseling on breastfeeding? So no, I did not have any counseling on that. I remember one appointment that I had with, with a midwife down in Nashua. She asked, you know, what are your plans? And I said, well, I'm, I plan to nurse. And she goes, okay, so it will be a learning curve for you and a learning curve for the baby. And that was pretty much it. And I was like, oh, yeah, learning curve. Uh -huh. And um, I went on, and, and then I hatched. And, well, it was quite a learning curve. And the other one that you mentioned the other night, I think it'll be okay if I tell them, is that um, when you come and say, this is what's happening, instead of saying, well, this is how you're going to fix it, and we and I would go, <laughs> that was great advice, right? Yeah. Right. And then you come back, yes? and then we say, see you in a week. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it isn't always something we can fix or even try and help you fix. We just have to say, mm -hmm. and that's how it's, it's easier. easier. Yeah. Right. And, and Elaine would just be like, just give it one more week. Just give it one more. Because I was like, oh man, formula. I got it, you know. Because I hear it from my grandparents and friends. And, and I would go in and I'd be like, what about formula Lane <laughs> or Emily? And they'd be like, well, why don't you just give it one more week? And I'd be like, okay, I'll give it one more week. <laughs> and then the next week I come in and I give him, you know, whatever. And he's not still not sleeping. Maybe formula would help him sleep. No, formula won't help him sleep. And mind you, Jimmy's been the same size since he was four months. Jimmy didn't need formula. <laughs> Is he getting yeah. enough? We must have to know. She would not mean to say, but we weighed him. <laughs> and we would. <laughs> oh, just to mention, the, the, Elaine and Emily have discovered that um, mothers in our culture are frequently concerned they don't have enough milk. And one in three mothers who abandons breastfeeding prematurely is it's because her perception or the reality is she's not making enough milk at that time. So their strategy has been to bring the scale every week. So those moms who are working real hard to get their skills up with their babies, to get to that place of ease and convenience, are having the, the you know, bulk quantitative feedback that they're, they're getting there. Okay. Um, well, I would say the same ditto. It's, it's the culture. It would be really helpful um, to other moms who don't get to go during the day and get all of that knowledge to be hearing that from the providers when they do go, whether it's six weeks or the two month checkup or the five month checkup. Um, that support is so critical. Um, I did make some notes on my story because I asked right about it. Um, I shrunk it down to one page, so <laughs> a lot of it you've already talked about. Um, 
I had Levi when I was 30, and then when I was 35, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then at age 44, <laughs> I found out that I was pregnant with someone. Um, I was very concerned about whether or not I would have enough milk. Um, you know, having gone through breast cancer, I was just kind of, I was so protective of my breasts, and this is what they were for, and I just so wanted to be able to breastfeed the second time. Um, and I was worried about my own ability to do that. Had two recent miscarriages just prior to that. I just felt like no matter what I did, my body just kept failing me. And this is not one thing that I wanted to fail on me. I wanted to be able to provide this baby the breast milk that, that he should have. Um, I was concerned at my age that I'd even be able to produce the milk that I could when I was younger. Um, I was going through a very difficult divorce at the time. Um, Sumner's father did not support breastfeeding. Um, and he even started to give him formula as soon as he could teach the baby how to take a bottle. Um, after two weeks after I had the baby, I lost my job. So I had a lot of stress, um, and I wasn't sure if the stress was going to affect my milk production. And at three weeks, I found these guys, and I would give my right arm to them. Not my first one, but my right arm. <laughs> um, and what a world of difference it made. They just were so supportive, and week after week I would go, and I was so worried he wasn't going to get um, but he wasn't gaining, because if he wasn't gaining, that would give an excuse to give more formula. Um, and they brought the scale, or they would invite me to come up, and, and I did. Um, and then after a few weeks, you know, I tried so hard to, to nurse from both sides, but the scar tissue was so painful. And it was just, you know, they were encouraging, just keep trying, keep trying, and then I just said, I can't do it anymore from that side. And, and again, it was, that's okay, you know, moms can feed from one side. And I thought, you know, I was done if, if I couldn't do that. Um, so we just went to one side, and, um, and it was fine. Um, I didn't have as much milk as I had when I was 30, and that bothered me. Um, so we talked a lot about you know, getting the right sleep and the proper nutrition, and we'd weigh him again the next week, and, and he was doing fine. Um, but boy, did I need that support. Um, Um, mom's club, just hearing from other moms, hearing the questions that they had. Because sometimes I wouldn't want to pipe up because I thought maybe we would all want to. We would learn, oh yeah, we're just normal. You know, and, and yeah, that's just how it's going to be. You know? So that was helpful for us. Um, my older son turned 16 tomorrow. He watched this whole thing. He's proud of his mom. So I hope that in our family, anyway, that we have changed that culture. He understands the importance of it. He sees his little brother thriving. He's going to be a good dad that's going to support his wife with breastfeeding. Um, he's been a patient of health. Um, he's never had a, an ear infection, nothing. Um, if he has a cold, it's one or two days. Um, the same thing with Sumner. He's rarely been sick, no ear infections or anything. So in addition to the health, which we all know is there, um, just the nurturing and the being able to bond with this baby that was just so special to me and that I could provide for him, he provided me just as much as I needed to. Almost 24 months. He's almost two. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So, just in a couple weeks, he'll be two. And we are still breastfeeding. So, um, kind of proud of myself for going on. But um, I will let him lean and let him decide when it's time. The language of the American Academy of Pediatrics statement on breastfeeding is recommended exclusive breastfeeding is six months, then with the addition of supplemental foods in the meeting table foods are continuing to breastfeed for at least a year and as long as is mutually desired. The World Health Organization recommends two years. And the Torah says at least two years, but no more than five. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a physical um, anthropologist um, in Texas who um, compared biologic measurements in primates so a whole bunch of primate species, how quickly do they double or triple their birth weight? How quickly do they lose their deciduous teeth and get their first permanent teeth? When do they, all these sort of uh, measurable parameters. And then what age was natural weaning among these different primate species? Took all that and then applied it to human beings. And by her analysis, our biologic heritage 
for duration of breastfeeding is two and a half to seven years. Um, obviously, it's not very common culturally, but in India, they're really smart. You know, there are a lot of waterborne diseases there and overcrowding and whatnot. And in India, culturally, the longer you breastfeed, the longer your child's going to live. Any other things you guys want to add? Because we're going to take a little break. We were not in the club this week, so the lighting was not nice. <laughs> <laughs> I just have one thing more about just saying what a position, kind of ideal position you all are. Um, among us, several of us had stories where one person made one comment, that people who are in this room that had really changed our course, where uh, either uh, give it another week or I bet you're going to be a purist and never, you know, never give formula. And I think probably people who made those comments don't even remember making them, but probably each of you have made those comments or can make those comments to women that will absolutely keep them on track and give them that next kind of step in determination until it becomes kind of second nature to, to be nursing your baby. So um, please do that. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a five-minute break, and then we'll go on to the next hour. <laughs> Relationships 
with our families, tribes, clan, culture, society. And breastfeeding is more than just a nutritional fluid that prevents diseases. The act of breastfeeding and mothers and babies coming together and interacting at the ideal focal length of the newborn helps form those early relationships from which all other relationships grow. And what is happening at the breast is not only delivery of the fluid that helps brains grow, but there's an awful lot of chatting and stroking and smiling and engaging and interacting that happens. I had a patient once when I lived in Tennessee who um, came in for a GYN visit and she goes, son of a gun? You know, I didn't realize the other day, but I hadn't held my baby for eight hours. How do you know? Well, we, we made a shopping trip up to uh, Cool Springs Mall, and I never took him out of the car seat for eight hours. And it was only after she took him out when they got home that she realized that that child had not been picked up for eight hours because she would have realized he had a 50-pound like, diaper on. <laughs> <laughs> and breastfeeding requires mothers to interact and engage with their babies more often than they might otherwise. There is some research to suggest that, well, first of all, there's research to show that babies of mothers with postpartum depression are more likely to have developmental problems. When the mother is, has psychomotor retardation and her affect is flat, and she is barely getting out of bed, she's not much good for interacting with her baby. But breastfeeding offers some protection from the impact on the child's development. And this is my theory. I don't know if it's worth anything. But maybe it's because, if nothing else, that baby's getting a responsive body of his mother, even if he's not getting a responsive engagement. Maybe there's more to it than we ever could have guessed. Medical model, neonatal transitional tasks, airway, breathing, circulation. Obviously, we don't go anywhere else if we don't take care of those. But let's go to the next step. What is after that? This is my, this is my theory. <laughs> it's not published yet, but there it is. <laughs> it's arrival. Sometimes with a few seconds of like, whoa, what a trip. Even if there's not primary apnea, that doesn't even require stimulation, but three or four seconds of like, whoa, I've just arrived, where am I? The birth cry, spanning the lungs, getting the breathing going, connection. Start to notice in the delivery room. If the baby is away from the mother, it's crying. You put the baby on the mother, it stops. She says, oh, there you are. The baby goes, are you my mother? <laughs> and then the father says something, are you my father? <laughs> and slide later, he says, in one day, by tracking eye movements of babies, you know, even though they're going like this, in one day, babies will pick their mother's face out of the lineup and look preferentially at her face. That relationship is forming in one day. And dinner. Oh, okay. I'm here. I'm breathing. I figured out who my mother is. If I stick with her, the predators won't get me. But where's food? And the children, babies have an instinctive sequence of behaviors to seek the breast and nipple, create the initial latch, and begin breastfeeding. And I tease, you know, I'm gonna, this is how I think, okay? You know that Lydia Nigra we got when we're pregnant? And the darkened areola? It's like the runway landing lights, you know? <laughs> That's where you're going? Head that way. <laughs> and what's our sequence? There's this cool video that I'm going to spend $50 to get because it's just so priceless. Most of the midwives, I'm sure, have seen it. It is so cool. It's from Brazil. And this guy basically did crotch shot after crotch shot after crotch shot of women giving birth in a squatting position. And it's actually up on a, like an OR table. <coughs> But they just sort of like made a nest, and the baby sort of plops. She's crouched up there, and the baby plops out. And then there's another crouch shot, and another baby pops out. And it just kept all these babies are plopping out. And they just sort of plop onto this little nest of blankets on the, on the table. And 
If you watch the mothers in this video, the mothers do the same sort of like, whoa, just what happened to me? Oh, look at that. Is it alive? I think I'll touch it. And they tend to start at the periphery. They'll start with the hands or the feet, often the hands. Then they'll go toward the body of the baby, draw it up to her chest, and then engage with the baby. So we have our sequences too. The baby has theirs, the mother has hers. And when you put those together, at birth, the baby doesn't have to be taught to breastfeed. We don't have to put the breast in the baby's mouth. The baby knows how to do it. Karen Strange is, uh, if you guys want to have an interesting, interesting neonatal resuscitation sometime, she's not so good with the drugs because she mostly teaches home birth midwives, <coughs> but she has gathered information from Britain and all over the world, all kinds of studies about newborn consciousness and how do we engage with this little person who's just arrived in the gentlest possible way to make sure ABCs get taken care of but not disrupt any of the other instinctive stuff that's about to happen. And she says, there is more that we don't know than we do know. So, if you're getting a little burned out on OB, or getting burned out going to births and standing there watching another baby come out healthy and wonder why you're there, start to be a keen observer about what is really happening with the mother and the baby that is part of their attachment and bonding that makes sure she is invested in taking care of that kid, keeping it away from the predators. So uh, over in the corner there, I have a copy of this book, Evidence Supported Practices. Um, there aren't tons of randomized prospective studies, but what I love about this book is there are nearly a thousand references. It's a synthesis of information from many disciplines. And it's kind of like doing a jigsaw puzzle, that you have this little piece of information, that little piece of information, and you start putting them all down, and after a while, the picture starts to emerge. And the, the impact of this book in bringing together all that's really happening around the time of the birth, oriented towards baby friendly, how can we support all of that instinctive unfolding in the baby? So a friend of mine, Diane Wiesinger, I want to be a her fellow speaker, but she was busy. Um, she has a master's degree and a bachelor's degree from um, Cornell University. She's still lives in Ithaca. And her, uh, she knows lots about evolutionary biology and uh, animal behavior. She's a mother of two, a uh, board-certified lactation consultant and international speaker. And she's got a little thing on her website for civilians, but she gives a fabulous well-referenced talk about what the zoologic and veterinary literature tells us about mammalian lactation. So she's a biologist who goes, hey, cool, maybe I can learn something else about breastfeeding because I think I know just about everything else. She wrote, wrote uh, she's one of the co-authors on the latest edition of The Womanly Art of Breastfeeding from the Late um, And so she wanted to go to the veterinary and zoologic literature to figure out what, what else could I learn about breastfeeding. And what she found was <clears throat> it's about the birth. Basically, the zoologic and veterinary literature says, if you don't screw up the birth, the lactation will take care of itself. And now, veterinarians who are dealing with, you know, I don't know, prize racehorses and purebred this and whatever purebred that, are doing more cesareans for animals, and they're trying to figure out how to overcome the problems they've introduced with their birth practices, because now they have to fix the lactation, and they never had to before. Provide the animal with privacy, leave it undisturbed, be available to help if it's needed, leave the mother and baby alone. So she's got a thing for civilians, but she, she gives a tr terrific, well-referenced well talk about this. All right, so I'm going to try to show you a video here.
Um, Heidi, is this it? Yes. term newborn. So I'm going to give you a little uh, commentary because I want you to notice a few other things as this is going on. This video on. is intended to assist staff in providing behaviorally appropriate, individualized, baby-adapted care for the full-term newborn using the best practice of skin-to-skin -skin contact in the first hour after birth. Advances in knowledge and skill regarding labor and birth allow most mothers to safely experience the birth of their baby, awake and aware. The stages of labor are well known, well documented. The process of cesarean surgery has become routine. Recent research has helped us understand that being in skin-to-skin -skin contact with the mother during the first hour after birth is a critical component in providing behaviorally appropriate individualized, baby-adapted care for the full-term newborn. Why is continuous uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin contact beginning immediately after birth important to the baby? This is a developmentally distinct time for the baby, and there are well-documented short and long-term physical and psychological advantages when the baby is held skin-to-skin -skin during this time. The baby who is held skin to skin cries less. Babies who are held skin to skin are warmer. Their body temperature balances with their mother's. <coughs> Babies who have skin to skin contact have more optimal blood glucose levels. Skin to skin contact after birth induces calmness and relaxation by decreasing the negative effects of the stress of being born. When babies are skin to skin with their mother, breastfeeding reflexes awaken naturally. <coughs> Continuous, uninterrupted skin to skin beginning immediately after birth provides an optimal time for maternal infant bonding. Mothers who have experienced skin to skin contact show increased sensitivity to the baby, even when measured one year later. Babies who have experienced skin-to-skin -skin contact with their mother have better self-regulation, as measured one year later. The baby has better competence to calm himself. The research demonstrating such dramatic advantages compels us as caregivers to provide behaviorally appropriate, individualized, baby-adapted care for the full-term newborn, and to assure that the baby without severe medical complications be placed skin to skin soon after birth and remain there uninterrupted until the completion of the first breastfeeding or for about the first hour if breastfeeding is not anticipated. When a baby is in skin to skin contact after birth, there are nine observable newborn stages happening in a specific order that are innate and instinctive for the baby. They are the birth cry, relaxation, awakening, activity, rest, crawling, familiarization, suckling, and sleeping. Within each of these stages, there are a variety of actions the baby may demonstrate. The baby may do one, some, or all of these actions. This section of the video will look closely at each of the nine stages during the first hour or so after birth and illustrate some of the individual variations that you might observe. <coughs> the first stage is the birth cry. This distinctive cry occurs immediately after birth as the baby's lungs expand. The second stage is the relaxation stage. During the relaxation stage, the newborn exhibits no mouth movements and the hands are relaxed. This stage usually begins when the birth cry has stopped.
The third stage is the awakening stage. During this stage, the newborn exhibits small thrusts of movement in the head and shoulders. This stage usually begins about three minutes after birth. The newborn in the awakening stage may exhibit head movement, open his eyes, show some mouth activity, and might move his shoulders. The fourth stage is the activity stage. During this stage, the newborn begins to make increased mouthing and sucking movements as the rooting reflex becomes more obvious. This stage usually begins about eight minutes after birth. During the activity stage, the newborn could exhibit stable open eyes. The newborn could look at the breast. She could salivate to the point of dampening her mother's skin. She could root by rubbing her mouth from side to side over the skin and stimulated by the sensation of rubbing her cheek against her mother's chest. She could move her hand to her mouth. Move her hand to the mother's breast and back to her mouth. Protrude her tongue. <laughs> she could look at her mother, although she may wait to do this until a later stage instead. She may massage the breast with one or both hands. So the afferent nerves from the nipple and the breast are sending a signal to the brain. The baby's down here and hungry. Uh -huh. Set down the prolactic oxytocin so that we warm up the heart. She could exhibit high rooting, rooting that includes lifting part of the baby's torso from the mother's chest. First, with any of the stages, the baby may rest. The baby may have periods of resting between periods of activity throughout the first hour or so after birth. The sixth stage is the crawling stage. The baby approaches the breast during this stage with short periods of action that result in reaching the breast and nipple. This stage usually begins about 35 minutes after birth. The crawling stage does not need to involve crawling. It could be accomplished through leaping, through sliding, sometimes in conjunction with rooting and questing. Through crawling, sometimes in conjunction with pushing and rooting.
As a reminder, rest can be interspersed with any of the stages. The seventh stage is called familiarization. During this stage, the newborn becomes acquainted with the mother by licking the nipple and touching and massaging her breast. This stage usually begins approximately 40 minutes after birth and could last for 20 minutes or more. During the familiarization stage, the baby may touch her mother's breast. a mouth on her own hand. This is all I have for nine months to suck on. May lick her mother's breast. May look at her mother. She may make soliciting sounds to get her mother's attention. She may mouth the nipple. Lick the nipple. She may move her hand from her mouth to her mother's breast. She may protrude her tongue. She may look at her father, which may solicit a response from him. He may massage his mother's breast. The eighth stage is suckling. During this stage, the newborn takes the nipple, self-attaches, and suckles. This early experience of learning to breastfeed usually begins about an hour after birth. The final stage is sleep. The baby, and sometimes the mother, fall into a restful sleep. Babies usually fall asleep about one and a half to two hours after birth.
And I just want to put it out there right now. One of the reasons I did not become a lactation consultant is because in my other roles, I couldn't slow down enough to mother and baby speed to continue to be of good help. I want to fix it. I want to tell her what you need to do. No. Um, I felt constrained by time to somehow convey information that was going to help them get it. This is mother baby pace. And that's why we are so lucky to have the lactation consultants. Because they can slow down with the mother and the baby to their speed while they figure it out. And if you got impatient with it, then some of it may be that we're always running and spinning, and, you know, getting on to the next one, on to the next one. And if you would like to provide help, make those one or two sentence encouragement statements and get them to the folks who have the skills and have the time and can slow down to the pace that the mother and the baby need. Okay, other fun facts. Neonates initiating the breast crawl, that you know, stepping reflex that we got taught in medical schools. Yeah, I don't use that anymore, even though you guys, the pediatricians and family medicine people do. But the baby's pushing against the fundus. The baby the uterus is getting fundal massage to help encourage evolution and decrease risk of hemorrhage. Uh, early and frequent nursing combined with colostrum's laxative effects. Not only does colostrum have a laxative effect, which helps get the meconium out, reduces interhepatic circulation of bilirubin, reduces peak bilirubin levels, yada, yada, yada. It also, suckling and the breast milk itself stimulate uh, gastric digestive hormones and substances. Uh, I mentioned earlier James McKenna and his mother baby sleep lab looking at uh, all different kinds of sleeping arrangements and all different kinds of feeding methods trying to understand what happens is that mothers and babies in close proximity and trained to one another and their sleep cycles come into sync. I had a first-hand experience with this. When Peter was about three weeks old, I thought he had a seizure. So we took him to the pediatrician and said, you know, go to Children's Hospital, you're going to be observed overnight. So, you know, he was wired for sound and, um, and we were, you know, he was going to be watched overnight. Well, um, it's probably is not going to come as a surprise, but I'm part of a co-sleeping family. And so they gave me a cot or a bed or whatever, and I had Peter nestled in my arm as I usually did. Um, and every time I fell into a deep sleep, the apnea monitor went off. Every time I fell into a deep sleep, his apnea monitor. And what, and it was like Chinese water torture. You know? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> and I think what was happening, because they had it set for like, I don't know what, his, what the respiratory alarm was for him, his respiratory rate was probably double mine. And as I slowed my respiratory rate in deep sleep, the alarm went off. They just changed the alarm and it was fine. And he had a seizure and all it was all great. But it was a great experience to show me that there was something real going on with the entrainment of mother and baby together. Power Touch, Tiffany Field at University of Miami School of Medicine. Tons of research, lots on NICU babies and a million other uh, ways of looking at it. Uh, NICU babies who get touch and massage 15 minutes per day grow faster, they're more attentive, uh, it alleviates depressive symptoms in other you know, grown ups reduces pain, reduces stress hormones, improves immune function. Um, over centuries, very high death rates in orphanages uh, have been a huge problem, and that can be mitigated by having a program to hold and caress the babies. Kangaroo care was started, I think, in Colombia in response to a low resource situation for low birth weight babies. So shoot, we don't have any incubators. What are we going to do with this kid? Well, maybe if we give him to the mother, here, let's put her, put him, put the baby right between her breasts, skin to skin, we'll put a blanket or a shirt or something over him. And, you know, I mean, he's breathing and everything, but what else can we do? We don't have any incubators. Um, in developed and developing world, reduces mortality, reduces rates of severe infection, shortens length of stay, improves weight gain, increases exclusive breastfeeding. 
So why can we not start to advocate kangaroo for mothers? I, I, I'm going to admit to being a little manipulative here with folks who, the clients we have that may not think that this is anything they want to have be part of. Breastfeeding or not is not material. Could uh, UT Memphis Hospital, which serves a large urban population, um, in the late 80s was sort of tricking their mothers. They were um, telling the mothers that they had to hold the baby skin to skin between their breasts for about 30 minutes after the birth in the hall on a gurney because they didn't have any rooms for anybody. But you had to be there with the baby skin to skin between the breasts because it was going to help prevent hemorrhage. The baby was going to massage the uterus with his feet, was going to be massaging the breasts, the oxytocin level was going to surge, and it was going to help prevent uh, um, hemorrhage in the mothers. Um, and of course, their breastfeeding rate went up. But might we not harness the mother's oxytocin surges and prolactin surges to enhance nurturing behaviors, attachment, and bonding? We can say part of it is to help prevent hemorrhage, help to stabilize the baby's body temperature, AEP recommendation, but have an impact on nurturing and uh, mutual attachment, even for uh, formula feeding mothers. Um, 30 studies, 1,925 participants, meaning mother baby dyads, um, significant and positive effects of early skin to skin contact on breastfeeding at one to four months, breast, total breastfeeding duration, maternal affection at love and touch maternal attachment behaviors, reduced crying, better, better cardiorespiratory stability, and no adverse effects were found. So oxytocin is considered the love hormone, um, and has been shown to increase positive regard, responsiveness, and receptivity. Uh, look at all these things that women especially like, okay? I mean, I think a lot of Grooming rituals and nurturing rituals, especially among women, increase positive regard, increase responsiveness, and increase receptivity to form relationships. So when that mom is having a hard time breastfeeding and is frazzled and strung out, suggest that maybe someone brush her hair while she's trying to nurse the baby or give her a foot massage while she's trying to nurse the baby. And that will help facilitate the flow of oxytocin, facilitate the letdown by the myoepithelial cells of the alveoli to bring the milk from back here where it's produced out to the middle. Practices that increase breastfeeding success from the book I was telling you about, prenatal education, prenatal endorsement from providers. Long, long time ago I read that the time that women, most women decide if they're going to breastfeed is before pregnancy or in the first trimester. So this is when to make the comments. How about that annual exam? Nice breast. You got great breast for breastfeeding. Okay, the guys are gonna have to say it a different way, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Spontaneous labor, um, doula support, having a vaginal birth, an unmedicated labor of birth, immediate skin to skin contact, leaving the amniotic fluid on the baby's hands, extended skin to skin contact, 24 hour rooming in, support after discharge, and mother to mother support. Perinatal practices that can undermine breastfeeding success or duration. Formula advertising, formula samples, IV hydration. Overhydration of the breast can do two things that undermine breastfeeding. One is it makes the breast more edematous, making it harder for the baby to latch on. If the, if the areola and the, and the distal part of the breast is soft, it's going to be much easier for the baby to latch on than if it's edematous. The other side of that is when mothers have gotten a lot of IV fluids in labor, it has been shown that the babies will have increased weight loss in the first few days because they were overhydrated from the IV fluids, particularly if oxytocin was administered. Natural oxytocin is pulsatile, and what's circulating in the bloodstream when we get at IV is much higher. Um, induction augmentation is associated with lower natural oxytocin pro, uh, pulses postpartum. So it may be that that mother really is having a harder time giving her baby the milk because her natural oxytocin production is lower. Epidurals are associated with decreased hand-mouth movements, poor motor organization, state control. There's lots more research 
Um, the medications are measurable in the baby's cord blood. Cesarean section, again, less pulsatile oxytocin, newborn suctioning, pharyngeal trauma, and uh, aversion behaviors. Nursery care, nighttime separation, pacifiers, artificial nipples. I talked about, oh, um, I'll come back to that when we get to sore nipples. Um, artificial feed supplements. So the problem with artificial nipples and pacifiers and supplements is you want the baby to have the maximal drive to nurse at the breast. You want the baby to suck at the breast. And every time a supplement is given, that hunger or that pacifier soothing the suck need of the infant has reduced an opportunity to learn at the breast and to stimulate production. Time feeds, schedule feeds, nipple shield. I I've been thinking of it as the nipple, as the nipple condom. Everybody kind of gets that. Um, the, the lactation consultants have told me that they're feeling a little hamstrung. That women who are not having an easy latch on want a bottle nipple looking thing on their boob to make them feel like it's going to be easier. And part of the reflexes are the protuberant nipple, when it's in the baby's mouth, triggers the baby to suck. So you saw the baby bobbing around, bobbing around, bobbing around. When it found the nipple, it went, oh, and started to suck. So when women have flat nipples or inverted nipples, it is harder for the baby. The baby doesn't have the instincts to trigger the suck. That baby has to experiment, stumble on the fact that if you start sucking, that it'll be there. So when you put a nipple shield on and you're getting less stimulation for their ultimate production, and a false, well, this is the equipment your mother has, what happens with flat nipples is the babies get really pissed. They're looking and looking and looking for the nipple. Oh, oh, where is it? Where is it? They start crying. You know, they bob around. They're, they're crying. And those babies, when they're learning how to nurse, will stumble on the fact that when they suck, it's there. And they learn by experience, if I just suck when my mother offers the breast, it'll be there. And they don't have that reflex initiating protuberant nipple to get them started. So those, if you see truly flat nipples, you can explain that the baby's not gonna get that nipple sticking out, at least for the first baby. Usually by the second baby, it's sticking out better. And that the baby's gonna need, you're gonna need more patience with your baby learning to nurse. Um, okay, so when you're making rounds and you're hearing about breastfeeding and how it's going, I want you to be thinking about how these factors come into play. So the nurses, I know I drive the nurses crazy sometimes because I've always got a comment about it. But one day we were making rounds and there were six or seven mother babies on the, on the floor and there had been two unmedicated births. Everybody else had gotten IV medication, epidural, intrathecal, C-section, whatever. Two unmedicated vaginal births. The rest had had, you know, obstetrical interventions for pain or otherwise. And there was only one baby nursing well. And that baby was, of course, one of the babies that had the natural vaginal birth. And I'm like, well, what's going on with the other one? Because there's a reason. And it turns out that that baby had been suctioned after birth. And it was showing some aversive behaviors. Like, I don't know if I'm going to put anything in there. Somebody really scratched my throat. It's kind of hurt now, so I'm, like, I'm not even sure I really want to suck on anything. And what happens when babies bottle feed is that they hump their tongue against the nipple to control the passive flow of formula out of the bottle. And in breastfeeding, the baby draws the nipple deep into their throats. And so if there's any kind of irritation in their throats, they're going to be a little hesitant to let anything go back that far. So here it was that if you listen, if you look, if you listen, all those things I just had in that, this list, the things that get in the way, listen. When breastfeeding is going well, how many of these were involved? And when it's not going so well? <laughs> How many of these things are involved? So let's just be a little bit more mindful of what we're doing, what we can do. You have great breast for breastfeeding. You have a nice soft areola, which is going to allow the baby to latch. You have nice protuberant nipples, you know, symmetrical, rounded breasts, you know, they're going to be able to nurse. If your 
were made to give birth, you can do this. You're almost there. Let's call a doula and try to tub, tub, toilet, walking. Uh, let's loosen your gown. The baby's coming. Look, your baby heard your voice and she's looking at you. Here, just settle the baby between your breasts and rest. This will help your bleeding stop. My goodness, he's looking for the breast. He wants to nurse. Your baby already knows you. Look how your baby calms down when you're close. Even though you had a cesarean, your baby's instincts are waking up. Babies cry less when they're held a lot. Be generous. The more you nurse today, the more milk you have tomorrow. If you sleep with your baby nearby, your sleep patterns will get in sync and you'll get more rest. Almost any breastfeeding problem can be overcome. Ask for help with your 